Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening's lecture, Research, Stewardship and Opportunities, the National Estuarine Research Reserve on the Thames, affectionately known as the NERV. Um, this lecture is part of the past and present visions of the Thames Lecture Series. Over the past few months, we've uh, presented five different visions for the Thames, mostly based on people. John Winthrop's vision, our founding father, the visions of African-American population, visions of immigrants, visions of the press, and visions of the community leaders who've been long longing to do something about State Pier. I'm Deborah Donovan. I'm a board member and chairman of the program committee for the Thames River Heritage Park Foundation and tonight's host. So tonight, continuing the vision theme, we're going from the social uh, world to the natural world, where you'll learn about the biologically rich and economically important ecosystem we know as the Thames River. Contrary to its name, the Thames is an estuary which is a unique transition zone where the Inland River water meets Long Island Sound. Like all estuaries, the Thames provides social, economic, and environmental benefits for our region, which are dependent upon healthy, well-functioning well estuarine habitats. Tonight, along with an overview of the historic and current uses of the Thames estuary, our speaker, Jamie Baudry, will discuss how NUR will advance estuary and coastal watershed management, delivering cutting edge research data and tools to increase education, stewardship and protection of this valuable resource and beloved river. The Thames River Heritage Park Foundation is delighted to host this lecture in partnership with Yukon Mar Marine Sciences, which is an institutional partner of the Thames River Heritage Park and Foundation. The foundation and park was established to connect, promote, support, and sustain the Thames River Heritage Park, a collection of heritage sites and parks linked by water that capture the history and culture of life along the Thames River. In collaboration with the more than 20 heritage sites and institutional partners comprising the park, the foundation carries out its mission through educational and historic boat and walking tours, self-guided audio tours, our popular hop on hop off harbor cruises on the water taxis, which connect passengers to the heritage sites on both sides of the Thames, and programs and events like this one. Like all of the foundation's programs and initiatives, this series is made possible thanks to the generous financial support of our members, sponsors, and people like you who donate gifts of time and treasure to support the sites and their stories for us in the present and for generations to come. Before I introduce our esteemed presenter, I wanna review a few etiquette guidelines for tonight's presentation. And these are simply guidelines to keep things sort of clean and not confusing for everybody. So if you wouldn't mind muting your microphone on your computer and muting your video for the duration of the lecture, we would appreciate it. Also, there will be questions and answers at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, please put it in the chat box on your screen. And please don't use the chat box to have a little chat with people who are participating here. Just put your questions in so we'll know what's what at the end of the program. And you can toggle your screen by to increase or decrease the view of the presenter and, and her slides. Now, what we've all been waiting for, research, stewardship, and opportunities. The natural. National Estuarine Research Reserve, NUR, on the Thames. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Jamie Baudry. Jamie is a marine ecosystems ecologist and modeler. She's assistant research professor in the Yukon Marine Science Department and is lead for the NOAA, NOAA S National, National Estuarine Research Reserve, NUR, in Connecticut. Thank you. <laughs> And thank you all for inviting me tonight. I'm gonna to take just a second and try to get rid of some of these things that are on the screen. Let's see if we can't make them go away. That's not much better. Okay. 
Two more seconds to try. There we go. Hide floating meeting controls. Perfect. All right. So I would like to start off by uh, by saying thank you, Deb. By the way, for the introduction. Um, there have been many people involved with the bringing the reserve into being, and this is just the the folks who have really had uh, a, a, an integral part in developing our management plan and our other documents that um, that brought us to where we are with a with a National Estuarine Research Reserve uh, designated in Connecticut. Uh, while I was certainly the Yukon lead on this effort over the last couple of years, um, that was really just my job was herding the cats, bringing everyone together at Yukon, bringing all the groups together um, and, and making things happen. My close, close counterpart in this was Kevin O'Brien at Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, or DEEP. Uh, and we were the, the two folks who, who kept us moving forward at the state level. Um, but we had a steering committee, many people who were involved with the writing and reviewing and input into this process. And this is just the people who actually put pen to paper. Um, in addition to the folks shown on this slide, we had hundreds of people attend, um, attend public meetings to give input on the site selection, on the environmental impact of this effort, and, uh, and in our five-year management plan. So a National Estuarine Research Reserve in Connecticut, we are joining a national network. That's the first N in that, in that NER uh, acronym. The NER system, the reserve system is, uh, we are the 30th to join the system. In this map, the blue states are where we find reserves. So in California, we have three reserves, Florida has three and South Carolina has two. And most other coastal states have one. Um, we were one of the last coastal states to get a reserve and, and we're blue on this map now. And Louisiana down there on, on the Gulf Coast is the, the final coastal state in, in the contiguous US that does not yet have a reserve, but they're working on it. We also have a few reserves on the Great Lakes. Um, under NOAA's definition of an estuary, which we usually think of as a place where rivers meet the sea, um, we do define the Great Lakes as estuaries um, in some cases. I mentioned Louisiana is coming online. Lake Michigan is also on track to get a reserve in the next couple of years. So this system, this network of 30 places will be increasing to 32 in relatively short order. So what is a research reserve? Uh, these are places that provide special protected areas for research, monitoring, education, and stewardship. One of the things that we emphasized during the designation process is that these are not marine protected areas. They are not preserves. They are not um, you know, a spatial planning effort like the Long Island Sound Blue Plan. These are areas of our states designated to conduct work that can move our understanding of the coastal environment forward. So again, the, those four pillars are research and monitoring, that's a single pillar, uh, stewardship, so taking care of the land, education, which is really um, focused on our K through 12, our teachers, and some free range learning by adults. Um, but then the other pillar is training, and that's our coastal training program that reaches out to municipalities and decision makers to help them understand uh, the intersection between science and society when it comes to living on the coast as humans and uh, making choices that are good for our environment. So the, the little tagline of the reserve system is that we conduct work that is locally relevant and nationally significant. There are big themes. I mentioned that we have those four pillars, research and monitoring, education, stewardship, and training. 
Um, but what we choose to do as Connecticut stakeholders within those four pillars can go in a lot of different directions. And that's where our management plan came into place, uh, came into play in helping us define what we wanted to do with the Connecticut Reserve, what was important to our community. Um, and there will be opportunities moving forward for the public to continue to give input. We'll be seeking advisors to, um, to help guide our priorities as we move forward. Reserves address complex coastal issues through multidisciplinary staff and partnerships. And again, those partnerships are formal, um, but also informal in many cases. And a reserve tailors those national programs to address priority coastal management issues. And I'm gonna give you some specific examples of what those national programs are and how we might move forward in Connecticut. So um, these are areas with, uh, that host a wide variety of recreational and commercial activities, including shellfish aquaculture, seaweed aquaculture, and commercial fishing. The establishment of, the establishment of a reserve does not change those activities. It does not um, put new restrictions on them. And in fact, we look at this as a way of opening up areas to additional commercial, well, additional recreational use, additional exposure for humans to these environments. In a few moments, I'm gonna be showing you a map of the reserve. Uh, our reserve is um, uh, a large portion of Long Island Sound and includes some state properties, some state parks and some natural area preserves. Because those, those land pieces are already owned by the state of Connecticut, the state will continue to hold the regulatory authority over, um, over these lands and over these activities with input from reserve staff. So an establishment of a reserve benefits these activities by increasing research, monitoring, and education that is directly relevant to our local Connecticut community. Before we zoom into Connecticut, we're zooming out to look at the reserve system on a, on a broader scale. Across the country, across the US, which includes uh, Puerto Rico and obviously Hawaii and Alaska, we have over 1.3 million acres um, designated as research reserves. These are places where those four pillars uh, come through, that the research monitoring, education training, and stewardship. And up on the slide here, I have um, some photos from around the reserve and, uh, and another tagline from the reserve system. So one of the goals of the reserve system or the primary goal is to use a place-based system of protected areas to create resilient estuaries and coastal waters, uh, watersheds where human and natural communities thrive. And that's the mission of the, um, the national reserve system. Our local Connecticut mission sounds very similar to this. So those system-wide and national programs, these are things that all reserves need to engage in. And I guess I should say how we're funded uh, because these are a lot of programs to be running. So NOAA provides uh, dedicated funding to each reserve. We get anywhere from about $780,000 to $800,000 a year from the federal government to support these activities. That's matched by about $300,000 uh, from uh, Yukon, from the state of Connecticut, and from our friends group. Right now, uh, Yukon is our major match, but as we grow the program, we're hoping to uh, bring in additional sources uh, of revenue to increase our reach, to increase our programming. With that core funding, those operation funds that we get from NOAA and in that matching dollars, we are required to do a number of different activities. The first is SWAMP. And I will say right now that NOAA loves acronyms. There is an acronym for just about everything. Uh, so SWAMP stands for the System-Wide Monitoring Program. In Eastern Connecticut, we will be deploying about four water quality buoys out in the sound and in some of the shallow areas, um, uh, like Mumford Cove, perhaps. We haven't decided exactly where they're going, but these buoys will record water quality data just about year round at 15 minute intervals. So this is a huge, um, uh, 
capacity building for our understanding of water quality in coastal Connecticut. We also have SAM-1 and SAM-2 Sentinel Site Application Module. Even the full name is opaque. Uh, basically, these two monitoring modules refers to going out um, to marshes and uh, evaluating the plant life and the animal life in these coastal marshes. Uh, the other piece is going underwater and looking at our native submerged grasses, eelgrass and rupia are two species of grasses that live underwater. Uh, if you're from Long Island Sound and especially the Eastern part, you may have seen seagrass in person in the water, but probably washed up along the coast. This is the long, thin, uh, blade-like grass that washes up on the coast. That eelgrass is a sign of excellent water quality. And because of that, we're really interested in understanding um, where it is and how we can support it so that we continue to grow that habitat. Another uh, required program is the Coastal Training Program. And that is where, uh, where we reach out to, um, to municipalities and to um, politicians and other interested groups, land trusts, town commissions, whoever is interested in learning more about not just the science of the coastal zone, but the policy and the management and how our decisions impact things. There. Um, one of the, so you may be familiar with uh, CERCO, which is the Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation. They do a lot of this coastal training already. They work with municipalities to, to build resilience to climate change. Um, one of the things that the reserve it will do is coordinate with groups like CERCA and like Connecticut Sea Grant and the Thames River Heritage Park so that we are adding to, um, adding to the work that is being done and not duplicating it. And again, that's where it's, uh, it's really important to get people's input uh, on what's going on in the environment and make sure that we are adding to the landscape in terms of what we're offering. Another program is the K-12 Estuarine Education Program. And in one of the photos here, you can see, actually two of the photos, you can see uh, some of the educational activities going on. That's called KEEP, K-12 Estuarine Education Program. And that's geared towards, um, towards our K through 12 students and getting them out into the environment. We've already started talking to uh, Project Doe, to NEST, to the Roger Torrey Peterson Estuary Center um, in partnering again to add to what work is being done already um, and instead of trying to duplicate what these other organizations are already doing really well. So where can the reserve add? Where can we um, expand the reach or amplify the voices of the organizations that are already working on these issues? Uh, two other programs, last two bullets here. Oh, Teachers on the Estuary. That's a program that is geared towards getting teachers out into the estuary, giving them lesson plans and materials to, um, to help them bring this estuarine education into the classroom. The last two bullet points here are, um, are not required, uh, but they are strongly encouraged. So the Margaret A. Davidson Fellowship brings a graduate student uh, into our reserve to work on issues that uh, they are interested in and that are relevant to our Connecticut community. And then the National Estuarine Research Reserve Science Collaborative is a pot of money that people who are interested in working in the reserve or partnering with the reserve staff can apply for. So this is generally geared towards, um, towards research or monitoring, but could go in other directions as well. And I should mention, you know, I, I am a scientist. For me, research often means science research, but research is definitely more broadly defined in the reserve system, uh, including social science, economic science, um, behavior change campaigns. So all of that uh, aspect of research is also included in that term. So let's, uh, let's talk about Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut has been wanting a reserve 
for a long time. Uh, the first step in getting a reserve is submitting a letter of interest. And this comes uh, from the governor uh, and deep uh, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection was the one who kind of initiated this, spearheaded it, wrote the letter, um, got the governor on board and has submitted that letter of interest more than once. Uh, the first letter went in in 1991. Uh, there was another letter that went in in 2004, another in 2007. And then in 2016, our letter was finally accepted. And I could, uh, I could go through all the reasons why um, in many cases, our letter was originally denied because of other priorities by NOAA, um, the lack of capacity by DEEP. So they had a sudden slate of retirees in, in following the letter of interest submitted in 2004 and um, funding issues for NOAA. So we finally got there in 2016. That, uh, that set off um, a multi-year process. Connecticut actually moved through it very fast because at the last moment, the Biden administration said, I wanna count the Connecticut Reserve in our year one accomplishments. So in order to do that, we had to double time our last year to get everything in place, get all the I's dotted and the T's crossed so that we were um, designated uh, by the end of that year one. That included, uh, well, no, the push came at the very end, but um, we started off with the site selection and nomination. And that happened in 2016 to 2019, uh, evaluating states, uh, uh, state properties throughout Connecticut uh, into Western Connecticut. We then in 2020 started the environmental impact statement and management plan. The environmental impact statement talks about how the reserve will impact the environment. In general, it's a beneficial uh, impact on the environment, but we look at obviously the natural environment, but also the historical context, the economic context, uh, the society, um, and the population and um, job prospects in the area. So that's all part of our environmental impact statement. The management plan really lays out our, um, our path forward over our first five years. So those two documents um, took about two years to complete. And uh, finally, in January 14th of this year, the NOAA and the federal government designated the Connecticut National Estuarine Research Reserve. Uh, we will officially open on July 1st. Um, that is when our funding comes in, where our, where our reserve gets started. Um, and between that January and July, we did have a designation ceremony. With COVID, we said, we don't want to have this inside, we wanna have it outside, which meant that we were waiting until May 21st, just a few weeks ago. Uh, this was held at the Avery Point campus. In the background of the photo in the upper right, you can see Long Island Sound in the background. And, um, and that is part of the reserve right there. So we are excited for the next stage, excited to get going uh, on the next phase of the reserve system. Uh, at this point, we have two staff members in place. Uh, I am the research coordinator of the reserve, and we have a, a um, center director and reserve manager. He has two titles there, one for UConn and one for NOAA. Uh, George McManus is a, a professor in the Department of Marine Sciences at UConn and will be leading us off. Uh, he is um, calling himself the interim uh, manager because he's hoping to retire sometime soon. And, uh, and so we will be looking for a new manager, but he graciously agreed to step in for at least a year to get us off the ground. All right, so where is our reserve? Um, our reserve covers a really um, large part of Eastern Long Island Sound and Western Fishers Island Sound. So in this map, um, the green areas are the land properties. Yukon Avery Point will be the headquarters. That's where our office spaces and lab spaces will be. Um, that's where people will come to visit us. 
Uh, and that's shown here on the map. Close to Avery Point, we have Bluff Point State Park. Uh, we call it Bluff Point Complex because it's actually Bluff Point State Park, Coastal Reserve, and Coastal Area Preserve. Um, and adjacent to that is Haley Farm State Park. You'll notice that, uh, well, I'll get to the water part in a minute. Over on the Connecticut River, we have two brackish or freshwater marsh areas. Up in the north, we have the Lord Cove Natural Area Preserve. And in the south, we have the Roger Torrey Peterson Natural Area Preserve, which used to be called the Great Island uh, Natural uh, Wildlife Management Area, has a new name, same location, new name. And De Deep Marine District Headquarters is also on the Connecticut River, which provides us with a place to store, uh, store and dock boats, kayaks, um, other outdoor educational type equipment so we can get people out to those two natural area preserves. Now, those who have uh, spent time at Bluff Point or Haley Farm know that they are pretty easily accessible to the general public. There's parking, there are pathways, um, and they see a lot of use. The two natural area preserves on the Connecticut River are a little less accessible. Uh, less accessible. And we're gonna hold on just a minute as I forgot to plug in my computer. Uh, and I will run out of battery here in just a moment. So two seconds. All right, there we go. So those areas on the Connecticut River are a little less accessible, and that's why we have plans for storing kayaks over on the Connecticut River, some boats, so that we can get people out to those areas. The large part of our reserve, though, is the aquatic portion, and it's this blue area um, that's showing up in the Lower Thames River, in the Lower Connecticut River, and then in this portion of, of the Eastern Sound. That um, that underwater area hosts a wide range of habitats. So uh, a view of these places, this is the deep Marine District headquarters with the Roger Torrey Peterson Estuary Center in the background and we're looking south along the Connecticut River. So that marsh area is part of the reserve. If we come back uh, here, the next picture, I believe, is for Lord Cove, which is um, the, further, the further north property in the Connecticut River. And this is the Lord Cove Natural Area Preserve. In the lower left, there's a nice little cutout photo of, of one of the views of that cove from the land side. So there are path, paths in these natural area preserves. Um, there's just not a whole lot of parking right now. Um, back to our map, if we look over on the eastern side, I'm going to show you some photos uh, from the Avery Point area. This is our Yukon Avery Point, and our offices, if you can hopefully see my arrow, are oh, right here in this area right here. So if you're looking for reserve staff, we are in the Lowell P. Weicker building on the Yukon Avery Point campus. Um, and this is a, a view of Pine Island. This is the island right here in the lower left, just off of the Avery Point campus. And we're looking at Bushy Point Island, the next island in, and Bluff Point State Park, um, or the Bluff Point Complex. Also included in the reserve are some of the embayments. So the Paquanic River is labeled in this map. And if we look at uh, Bluff Point from a different direction, so now we're getting, we're seeing that rocky bluff of the Bluff Point where my arrow is showing. But the, um, the embayments of Paquanic River, Mumford Cove and Palmer Cove are also part of the reserve. And this is important, uh, it's, well, it, I always think it's important because it is definitely where my research interests lay, is in these very shallow uh, embayments um, and I find them interesting because they are the place where people experience the water. Most people are not out in the middle of Long Island Sound. They're at the beach. They are kayaking in these coves. And, um, and for me, I want to make these places accessible to people, but also keep them protected, keep them healthy, 
keep their water quality good and their habitat quality good. So that's, that's one of my major interests. And I was very excited to include um, these shallow embayments in the reserve. This is a view from Bluff Point, uh, looking uh, out Long Island Sound towards the Atlantic Ocean to just to give you an idea of that bluff. If you've never been to Bluff Point and gone out to the bluff, I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful location. And Haley Farm State Park. So we're looking south here. Um, and Haley Farm State Park is this wooded area over here that extends beyond this picture, but includes um, Palmer Cove in our reserve as well. So the underwater portion. So now we're looking at the underwater portion. It's in green is the outline of our underwater portion. This black line is the boundary between Connecticut and New York. And the different shades of blue in the water are, um, are different types of habitat. So where you see the darker blue, that's gravel. Those are big, uh, big boulder fields, um, large rocks in that system. They provide a lot of structure, a lot of habitat for different organisms out there, including cold water corals. We're very excited to have some cold water corals located within the reserve property. The lighter blue um, is uh, gravel and sand, and then you get to the very light blue, and that's soft bottom. In this map, uh, red areas are where we find eelgrass, and that is that submerged plant, that submerged aquatic plant. We've only got two species of it in Long Island Sound, eelgrass and rupia. And, uh, and what we find is that um, the area of the reserve includes most of the eelgrass that we find in Connecticut. Um, once you get further west than this, you don't see eelgrass uh, occurring into the Western Sound. And, oh, excellent, I forgot I had this picture in here. The left picture is a scup swimming uh, over eelgrass, uh, courtesy of one of our uh, close partners, Cornell Cooperative Extension uh, out on Long Island. Um, they do a lot of seagrass work and again, a vital habitat for the system. The center photo is a sand shrimp burrowing in mud and over on the right, it looks like it's at night, but it's really just dark when you get deep down in the sound. And, uh, and the light from the, uh, from the submersible is lighting up the bottom and you're seeing a lot of sea stars, sea urchins and some bivalve shells uh, open because both the sea urchins and the sea stars like to eat those bivalves, those clams, those oysters, those mussels. So um, again, another step back to think about the reserve overall. Uh, our vision, and again, we, we workshop this with a, a large groups of stakeholders that, um, that came to our public meetings. Um, so our vision, is a resilient, healthy Long Island Sound estuary and watershed where human and natural communities thrive. That is pretty similar to the reserve, to the National Reserve System goal, uh, vision rather. Our mission departs a little. So we came up with to collaboratively integrate science with conservation, learning, recreation, and economic viability using ecologically diverse sites in southeastern Connecticut. So that includes both our water and our land and the watershed that drains to this reserve area. So the land that, that contributes or impacts this reserve area. One of the things that came out of our, um, our public meetings was the importance of recreational use and commercial use of our coastal waters. It's a big part of our culture. We have working waterfronts. We have um, an economy of both tourism and food producing that relies on the coastal environment. So adding in that economic viability piece is, um, I won't say it's unique for Connecticut because other reserves certainly consider this but it is unique enough that we put it into our mission to say this is a, a foundation for what we consider important in Connecticut. We also talked about what coastal management issues we wanted to focus on. 
And it seems like it covers everything here, but this is, comes from a much broader list of coastal management issues. The applying science, protecting places, and educating communities is another tagline from the reserve system. Um, these are what the reserve system really wants to do. These three things, apply the science, protect the places, educate the communities. And we took our coastal management issues and defined them in each of these categories. Not surprisingly, if, if you keep up with, uh, with what is of interest in Connecticut, climate-related impacts, water quality, and habitat integrity became, you know, were, were key points for us. We want to maintain habitat connectivity. That means um, corridors where animals can migrate, where plants can migrate, um, those, those large green spaces which really contribute to the health of the environment. Along with that, you support diversity and integrity in that habitat. But this is where we get back to the human side. So developing solutions and making decisions which integrate the needs of humans with the needs of the environment. Green development was also measure, mentioned heavily by our stakeholders. In terms of educating communities, not just K through 12 education, but community engagement, training, outreach, increasing equitable and responsible access to coastal resources, and increasing the capacity to make informed decisions about our coastal environment. Our niche, which is the unique suite of functions to address these unmet needs, um, will continue to be based on feedback from stakeholders and they get into those things that I've been saying all along. So the monitoring, translating data for our stakeholders, increasing access to these places, and translating science into effective management of the natural environment. So what does this look like? I, I pulled a few examples from the reserves because you know, these are all big picture topics. They're, um, they are so broad that it's hard to really get a grasp on what I'm talking about. So these are some examples in each of our four core or pillar areas um, of work that's been going on. So in the lower right-hand corner, you're looking at a black cloth and there are little pellets, little colored pellets. Those are called nurdles. And nurdles, that's their official real name, are virgin plastic. So this is what plastic looks like when it is first made and it gets packaged into container ships, it gets shipped to facilities, and those little pellets get turned into all the plastic things around us. Um, unfortunately, as with many shipping things, uh, ship containers break open, the nurdles get spilled, they get dumped in the sea and become a passive tracer. Well, actually not such a passive tracer, they become a tracer of those, those currents. So what you're seeing here is the, the fellow crawling along the beach. He's on the Nurdle Patrol. Um, this is a, a nationwide effort to go to the beach. You spend five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever, whatever time you're willing to, looking for nurdles. And you report out on how many nurdles you found on the beach. And this tells us as researchers, you know, where is this coming from? we can trace it back to places where this plastic is being spilled into the ocean. Uh, we don't get many nurdles on the East Coast. Uh, Texas is a large uh, originator of this virgin plastic, these nurdles. Um, so the Gulf Coast sees many, and that's where these folks are from. But we do still find these nurdles on our beaches and have people that are involved in the nurdle patrol. So this is one of those national efforts. You get a lot, you get 30 reserves going on this and you can get a lot of data from around the country. In terms of education, this is, a, this is an example of an education project from the Hudson River Estuary. So these are glass eels and glass eels migrate from the uh, sea upstream and then back down. So what these kids are doing here is they are involved with trapping the glass eels, counting them, and quantifying um, both the timing of the migration and the abundance of these eels in the environment. This is a project um, led by Chris Bowser, who is in the red shirt here in the middle. He's the education coordinator for the Hudson River. 
uh, reserve. And this program has going on for years. Um, we had him come and give a talk. If you guys are looking for other speakers, he is amazing and dynamic and super interesting uh, story to hear about the eels. In fact, I know someone who, um, who built an eel mop to deploy into our local system. It literally looks like a mop and you, the eels will stop in the mop and rest on their migration up. So it gives them a little place to rest, but you can also go and see them. Uh, we don't get as many eels as these guys do, but we do get some. For stewardship, there's really a broad range of stewardship activities, but these two show, show some of the more common ones. Um, planting, uh, invasive species management, so removing invasive species, restoring habitats by planting things. For us, it's not gonna be mangroves like this picture. This is from, uh, from Puerto Rico, I believe. Uh, we will be probably doing things like eelgrass and um, marsh plants, living shorelines, uh, that, that type of activity. Um, in the upper photo, we see an exclusion. This is a turtle exclusion, but but predator exclusions around bird nests are common sites in Connecticut. So that stewardship piece really brings in a lot of people um, who can come in and volunteer with the reserve either long-term or for just an event to get involved in these uh, activities. And finally, the coastal training program. You'll notice there are a lot of classroom pictures here. Um, this is a, a really structured way of thinking about the coastal environment, about decision-making, risk management, and how we move forward in whatever coastal management issue uh, is being addressed. But it also brings people out into the environment. And that's one thing that we think we'll be doing in Connecticut is hopefully reaching out to conservation commissions and other um, people at the town level who are making decisions in their um, in their neighborhood and bringing them to the reserve. So you're not just in a classroom learning about a marsh, they get to go out and see this is a marsh. Um, this is what we are making decisions about. Um, this is the impact of certain choices that you might make regarding stormwater management or development in the area. Um, so we're looking forward to, to this side of it. So what's ahead for us? Um, one of the things that we'll be doing, hopefully within our first five years, is, um, is developing some signage at these places. That we hope to get done within the first year. So some signs to indicate that you are in a National Estuarine Research Reserve. Um, in some of these areas like Bluff Point and Haley Farm State Park, we'd like to build educational pavilions. This is one from Rocky Neck State Park showing here, but this place that can become an outdoor classroom not just for reserve programs, but for all sorts of users of those state parks. And then in the upper left, you see um, the building uh, from New Jersey, which houses the reserve. We do hope to build a, a new um, building on the Yukon Avery Point campus that will become the home of our reserve system. This is an example of some of the signs that we'd like to see um, up in the state parks and the natural area preserves at deep marine headquarters and on the Yukon Avery Point campus. Um, so these are, you know, there we see them. Uh, in fact, I think the um, that some just went up recently in in uh, Bluff Point. So there are some additional new signs at Bluff Point if you want to try and find them out on the trail. Not reserve related, but um, definitely within the reserve. But we also want to get people engaged. So these are, these are static. They're great. They're informative. Um, but we'd also like to do something a little more integrative. So this is an example. I think it's from um, Ace Basin in South Carolina. And in the, right, uh, in the right, you see a camera station. So what you do is you're out hiking in Ace Basin. You have your cell phone. You set it on this platform and you take a photo. On the left is the photo that I took from this, from this photo station. This is getting people involved in science because not only are you taking the photo, but you're then submitting it um, to a website 
And you can go to that website and see how that place has changed over the seasons and over the years. Um, and this is an example here from the Botany Bay Beach in, in Ace Basin. Note the, the comment that I blew up on the bottom. It says log description. Unfortunately, our station has been washed away from extreme erosion from king tides. And in this photo, you can see some tree roots sticking up. Again, this is a, a photo that I took from the Ace Basin area. And you see the, um, the massive erosion that is occurring in this place. So this is again, getting people involved in the science of this system. So what's next for Connecticut? Uh, we're joining this reserve system. And, um, and I would just like to play a quick two minute video um, to show you kind of uh, around the reserve system. This was from last summer. All right, so um, next up for Connecticut, we will be opening in July, as I mentioned. We'll have volunteer opportunities um, to help out with stewardship and education in the reserve. Um, we already have a friends group established and they are hoping to lead up that uh, volunteer effort to help not just with that education and stewardship, but also to get people out into the environment um, assisting us with the research piece. Um, and of course, education is a big part of what we do in the reserve. So bringing people out to the system um, to experience Long Island Sound, to experience these coastal areas is very important. So we are excited to get started. We're in the process of uh, gearing up, getting our staff on board, and, um, and we hope to be having a community event to welcome everyone to the reserve, to meet the staff, to visit these places sometime in the fall. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. That was great. Nurdles, nurdles, who knew? Who knew? Um, I don't know, I'll, I just wanna thank Jamie, but I wanna thank all of you who've joined us tonight for your time, for your questions, and for supporting the park. Yep. Yes, is uh, Catherine wants to know if Alewife Cove here is part of the NERV. So I won't zoom back up. Uh, Alewife Cove is, is uh, one of our very skinny, tiny stream-like coves. And uh, the cove itself is not part of the reserve waterway, 
But the um, one of the things that we do with the reserve is we draw the watershed boundaries. So the area that, um, that drains to the reserve lands, that drains to the reserve waters. So while Alewife Cove is in, in, the, in the reserve, it is definitely in the area of influence of the reserve, which means that we can, we can do education, research, uh, stewardship in those areas that, are, uh, that impact the reserve. So I noticed also that um, like Harkness State Park isn't part of the reserve. Yeah. And I know this came up at one of the uh, early presentations that I went to and I can't remember why. Right, so we, um, we evaluated, I would say just about uh, all of the state parks, natural area preserves, wildlife management areas uh, along the coastal corridor of Connecticut. And this was that three year long process of uh, talking to the public, getting input, and then a lot of data analysis. There were about 30 people on that team. Some looked at education, some looked at um, research, some looked at stewardship, habitat quality. Um, and out of that, we had to select a subset of properties. So one of the things that you balance when you're coming up with a reserve uh, site is can you manage it? Can you deliver programs to it? Um, we selected the properties that we felt we could handle um, in our first five years, but we always have the option of adding additional properties as we move on. So as you look at some of these older reserves, reserves that are 30 years, they may have uh, properties that are much larger, um, spread out all across their state, so we hope to get there. Um, we're not there yet. But also part of the balance um, with Harkness, for example, is it's already a very well-used park. Same with Rocky Neck and, and um, Hammonasset. Um, so putting a reserve in those areas means that now you're balancing a lot of competing, um, competing interests. Those state parks are really well-used and have you know, support. They have park rangers at them. They have facilities, they have bathroom facilities. Contrast that with Bluff Point, which has porta potties and some, some folks who do park maintenance, but you don't have you know, someone greeting you and giving you information. So it's it, part of that ability to build capacity in our state parks um, also played into the mix of it, but it was much broader than that when we were considering it. I focused on state properties, but um, but other lands are potential. So the reserve could in the future purchase lands uh, for conservation. They could work with land trusts and bring um, land trust lands into the reserve. Um, and let's say uh, a land trust wants to um, designate part of their properties as part of the reserve. They still own the land. They're still the land owner. It's just that they are now part of the reserve as well. So those are all options for the future. Okay. Let's open up the chat. So um, the question is, are you doing any data sharing with other research yeah, institutes from Oyster Bay, Great Gull Island, Shelter Harbor? Um, not right now, because we haven't gotten started yet, but, um, but all of those data sharing is a big part of NOAA's mission. Um, they have an open data platform. They make it available to all researchers, but they go a step forward further than that in that um, much of the data is accessible to teachers and comes with, um, with uh, lesson plans. I'm trying to remember the term, data mysteries, that's it. So uh, data mysteries are ways that NOAA, you know, creates data mysteries for students to engage in. So it is, um, I think it's part of what we'll be doing, uh, but yes, not yet. Um, would retention walks to curb erosion be part of your mission, like raising Bluff Point parking lot to prevent tidal flooding? So uh, I will say, if you have a strong interest in that, get in touch with me. 
Um, it is definitely an issue. And it was something that we knew going into Bluff Point um, as one of our properties that there is coastal flooding issue as the roadway goes under the train bridge. That's really hard to lift. It's just going to get worse. Um, so coastal resilience to flooding is a part of the reserve system. And again, that's where the reserve is giving back to the state in the sense that we will be thinking about issues like that around these properties. Um, how do you envision public schools interfacing with the reserve? So uh, first I will say that, um, that we will be hiring coordinators. So I am the research and monitoring coordinator. We will have an education coordinator, a stewardship coordinator, and a coastal training program coordinator. Um, so uh, I was certainly involved with the management plan, so can speak to that. But once our education coordinator comes on board, which we hope is sometime this summer, uh, that person will really be driving um, that program and getting input from people. But we, um, we will be bringing programs to the local schools and hopefully bringing school groups to the reserve properties. Um, there is a lot of environmental education in southeastern Connecticut, and we want to um, add to that landscape without, you know, trying to compete, to drive others out of business. Uh, that's what we want to avoid. So we do envision uh, partnering with existing environmental education partners to help us bring the reserve programming into the schools and to get the school groups out into the reserve system. So again, building capacity uh, for what we already do very well in southeastern Connecticut. Um, are bait fish for larger fish and birds part of the research? Absolutely. <laughs> um, we, we will be looking at the whole food web um, from our primary producers right up through our, our forage fish, our bait fish, and how they support those uh, larger animals. And I will say I've already had um, our, our local Yukon researcher, Hannes Bauman, on, who, who works on silver sides and the mummachogs and the uh, other larger fish, uh, Bunker and Menhaden, um, catch me in the hall and say, hey, let's talk. <laughs> let's, let's talk about fish, because um, I am definitely a plant person. Uh, so yes, we will be looking at um, many aspects of the ecosystem. Yep, I think those are all. So, yeah, go ahead. So, um, you, you had talked about uh, efforts to not duplicate uh, data. Is, is there, or does it exist, or are there plans for some sort of clearinghouse of existing data that's out there so that, that you can kind of check before you go and put a, a buoy in this code because somebody's been monitoring it for? 20 years or something. Yeah, so that's a great question. And the first year, so our buoys won't be going out until a year and a half, two years from now because of exactly this kind of consideration. Um, we've already had a lot of involvement from people who have been doing monitoring in this area. Uh, so we know a lot about what's going on. Um, and, and that all plays a role in where we choose to put those buoys. So for example, the USGS has two buoys in the lower Connecticut River. If they are committed to maintaining those, you know, for more than 10 years, then we don't need to put another buoy in the lower Connecticut River. Um, and similarly, you know, there are a lot of local organizations that are involved with water quality monitoring. So CUSH, Save the River, Save the Hills, um, uh, Ness, and the Mystic Aquarium all do water quality monitoring in this reserve area. So again, keeping in touch with them and looking at where we can expand those efforts is important. Yeah. And I will mention that Connecticut, Connecticut I'm working on a program with um, Save the Sound and um, uh, Harbor Watch and the, uh, the Maritime Aquarium looking at developing a community-based data platform for water quality data. So that's all 
you know, right there at the top of my mind is how, how do we get all this data together and how do we use it? How do we make it usable and accessible? Okay, well, as I started to say before I got into the questions, here is thank you for your time. Thank you for your questions and for supporting the park. Another edition of our stories from the park will be coming very soon. And we um, hope that you will join us in the fall and next winter when our 2022-23 lecture series continues. I might add, if you have any ideas for talks, relating to the natural, social, cultural history of the area, uh, we'd be happy to talk to you. So give us a buzz. You can go on our website and send us a little notice. In the meantime, we invite you to discover more about the Thames on our narrated boat tours, um, which just started, our boat season started this past weekend. We have topics such as the whaling industry, the military history of the area, the Gilded Age, the African-American experience in the Thames Heritage Park area, the Native Americans and their relationship to the river, which is very, very interesting. Revolutionary war stories, ghost stories, and so forth. And we also do Friday happy hour cruises, which are happy and fun and interesting. Full moon cruises and fireworks cruises. So please join us for some of these events this summer. So, as I mentioned earlier, this program was made possible thanks to the generous contributions from our sponsors, some of whom you see here, uh, our members, and people like you whose support helps to fund our lecture series, our cruises, our inaugural Docent Academy, which, which is recently completed, our harbor cruises, and a Discover the Thames campaign, which is promoting tourism along the Thames. If you drive on I-95 down in Pierfield County, you may see a really cool billboard which highlights lots of our members. And it's a rotating billboard. So that's going to be going on this summer. 